innovation is the essence of human evolution. And evolution in health is not possible without ongoing change and innovation. It is this very ability of us as Australians to constantly change the status quo and come up with disruptive and innovative solutions forward that set us up as leaders in health on a global stage. So what are the forces currently challenging our health system today? What are the areas we need to be the most innovative? Well, firstly, I'm sure you'll all agree that each day we are pushing our medical frontiers just that little bit more to do more and more complex cases with increased volume. At the same time, we are facing a population that's not only rising in size, it's also rising in life expectancy. And growth must be sustainable. In this space, intelligent use of technology such as augmented reality, virtual reality, and 3D printing can and is helping transform the health system today because not only does it help us do things better and faster, it also helps us do things a lot cheaper. This innovation, this, this such innovative technology is here now and that's why it's really important that we embrace it and engage with it. Most of you today are wearing a red patient ID bracelet. And on that bracelet, using a technology called augmented reality, you can get in 3D, you can view in 3D some administrative information about the day, such as the program for the day or the map for the day. This technology didn't cost you anything. All you had to have access to was your phone, the internet, and a picture. And that picture could have been in any form. It could have been a business card could have been a logo on your t-shirt, could have been like my daughter's augmented reality miracle tattoo. Um, the point is that we are able to do this quite easily, but not just that. What if we took this a step further and put in it information about medical health? What if I told you that right now, my colleagues and I are using this technology to put complex patient anatomical information to engage our patients with conversation, in conversation about their health, about their interventions, and, and educate them and empower them about what's happening to their body. What if I told you that right now I'm doing research in an area where we're using this technology to 3D print their body parts such as their bones and perform surgery beforehand to pre-plan it so we can improve the surgical outcomes of our patients? What if I told you that right now we're able to publish this information in virtual reality such that we can operate with, a, with another colleague who's either in a different state or even a different country and plan our surgery together, train each other so the patient doesn't have to travel? What if I told you that right now we're working on technology that, enables, that will enable us in the future to harvest a bit of fat from a patient's belly? culture stem cells from that fat, and when that patient needs to have a resection of a bit of their body part because it's affected with disease or cancer, we're able to use those stem cells and 3D print another body part to replace that defect. Well, let's not keep you wondering any longer because that technology is already here. Please join me in sharing some practical examples about how these technology, technologies can make um, practical differences to patients' life. To help me tell the story, please um, welcome my co-presenters, uh, Professor Jonathan Clark, who is a um, pioneering professor and head and neck surgeon at the University of Sydney and also the Director of Research and Fellowship at RPN Lifehouse. The ever-creative <laughs> Kai Cheng, who is our Surgical Innovations Research Officer and a PhD candidate um, at the University of Sydney. A master of virtual reality, Dr. Hamish McDougall, who is the Principal Research Fellow of the Garnet Pass and Rodney Williams Memorial Foundation and a Senior Lecturer at the University of Sydney. And our best gift from Paris, Dr. Elodie Chiravano, who is our Postdoctoral Research Fellow and also an Associate Lecturer at the University of Sydney. 
to begin with, I would like to show you, um, oh, before I go on, I really want to acknowledge um, the institutions funding this research, the Sydney Local Health District, of course, and the RP Institute of Academic Surgery, and also the Garnet Pass and Rodney Williams Memorial Foundation. To begin with, I'd like to take you through an example of augmented reality. But to do that, you're going to have to come with me to the emergency department. So here we are in the emergency department, and this is Luca, our very diligent research officer. Luca is Italian, so he doesn't speak much English, so I'm going to be doing the talking for him today. Um, Luca, uh, our research officer, has a very, is, although very hard working, has a very bad habit. He likes to chew on the end of pens, which um, uh, I'm sure many of you also share. Um, however, it's no laughing matter because it's what's ended Luca in emergency department today. You see, apart from just chewing on his pens, he also has another bad habit. He really enjoys laughing at his research supervisor's jokes, even though they're not that funny. Um, and what, this one time he laughed a little bit too hard and he feels that he's inhaled uh, the tip of a pen lid. And I've done an x-ray, I can't really quite see it, so I'm just going to ask Kai, our research officer, Kai, is there any way we can visualise this a little bit better? Because I can't quite seem to um, see what's going on. Yeah, actually we can use augmented reality to visualise the situation. Okay, well let's have a go. So I'm just going to go on to our app um, that everybody else has been using today. And, okay, so here we go. So here we have a view of the lungs and the heart. And you can see the liver and a bit of the bowel. And if we just get a bit of a closer view in towards the heart, we can see the major vessels. There's the aorta, oh, and there's our region of interest. This is the main airway, uh, the trachea, and the food pipe just behind it. Now, if I have a look down the trachea, do you, hopefully we see something. Oh, here we go. It looks like yeah, a pen lid. Yes, Luca, you sure have nailed a pen lid. And the reason Luca's so stable and in not significant discomfort is that pen lid is not obstructing his airway. That's the right main bronchus that the pen lid is sitting on. So that is very useful because now I know exactly where to find the foreign body when I take now, Luca to theatre. we see the lung anatomy. How do lungs actually work? Well, I, that's a very interesting question. And you know, I think education is done, best done by visualisation. I've got these beautiful slides of histology of lung tissue that Professor Key has given me from the School of Anatomy, the Anatomy Museum. But the only thing is I need a microscope to be able to visualise it. And microscope, a microscope. Are... You want to have a look? You sure? Here? Yes. Let's go. Okay. Let's, get Let's give it a go. Hmm. <laughs> I have a small gadget. Yeah. And actually it's a serious um, microscope for your smartphone. It's not a microscope. That's a little small gadget. No, it's not a toy. It's a microscope. So it's only weigh about four gram, and only about five millimeter in thickness. That's a lot lighter than a yeah, microscope. Yeah, but it's very powerful. <laughs> it will give you 18 to 400 times magnification. No way. Okay, well, how do you use it then? Yeah, actually, it's simple. You just clip on the smartphone, and it's ready to use. You want to have a look at your um, slides? Yeah, that's my slide. Let's go. Yeah. Okay. Right, wow, so this is a low power view of uh, lung tissue and the purple is a bit of a bronchus, uh, the airway, and these little black structures, Kai, they have black in them because that's blood, I presume they're blood vessels. And one of these black structures have a thicker wall mm -hmm. and one of them has a thinner wall. So the thicker wall structure is the artery and the thinner wall structure is the vein. So let's move around a little bit and have a look at this purple structure here. And, and let's zoom up a little bit because I think that's the cartilage that surrounds the, the airway that we were seeing uh, in uh, Luca's chest. And that cartilage um, is surrounded by a bit of black and that's muscle. And that mm -hmm. muscle is what, when it contracts, causes spasm of the airway like in asthma, it causes an asthma attack. And around that airway is this honeycomb structure. It's what those airways sort of split into smaller and smaller parts and end up in these little air sacs where air ends up. And all of these blood vessels take blood to those air sacs and exchange oxygen. So the oxygen comes in through the lung and goes into the bloodstream. But this is amazing. I wish, I wonder what would happen if, say, I use this on my hand. So I'm just using this on my skin right now. And this is low power. And 
It's amazing the detail you can see, uh, you know, including sort of the root of the hair shaft and all. Imagine the benefit of this to dermatologists in their clinic uh, in diagnosing skin cancer. Um, not just that, I think this would be extremely useful. I mean, even for me as a surgeon, if I had something like this in theatre um, and I excised a bit of tissue, I could have a look at it straight away. Thank you so much, no Kai. Worries. So what I want to do now, I'm going to go over to Hamish's lab because being more of an ear surgeon these days rather than a throat surgeon, I'd need to take Luca back to theatre, but sure. it'd be nice to have some simulation training and some airway work because I haven't done it for a while. Okay. I'll catch you in a bit. Yep. Ah, Dr. McDougall, you're uh, obviously playing uh, with a giant eye. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you're doing in there? Hi, Paya. Yes, I'm just uh, reminding myself about the complex geometry of the eye muscles. Wow. Look, I wish I had something like this when I was a medical trainee because I found this anatomy really difficult to learn. But you're using this for research, so can you tell me a little bit about how this helps in research? Yes, actually, we don't really research eye movements per se. We're actually interested in vestibular function or the function of the balance sensors in your inner ear. Mm. It so happens, though, that measuring eye movements and eye muscle responses is a really good way to assess inner ear function. So I have to know kind of a little bit about this complex geometry. Wow. Um, look, I've got a patient who I need to take to theatre um, and I need to do a little bit of simulation work with um, an operative scenario. Do you have anything you could help me out with, do you think? Uh, sure do. I'm glad you asked me that question. We've got an operating theatre we've been working on recently. Right. Do you mind if I hop in with you? Please do. Lovely. So this is a bit of a proof of concept, I have to admit. Uh, we've spent a couple of months on building... Uh, our cartoon version of an operating theatre. But I think uh, it seems a little convincing to me. I have powerful lights hanging on booms. Everything's fully three-dimensional to me. Uh, we implemented some nice interactive features. So, for example, over here, the patient monitor screen actually animates vital signs in real time. And if I look over here, we hung an x-ray here, and I thought it was really great the day this started working because it's actually transparent in all the right places. So wow. if I hold my laparoscopic instrument behind it, you can see through the light parts. Lovely, and there's a mirror. There's a mirror Hello. there. Can you see yourself no, in the I mirror? I can. So that's us, the two of us, together yeah. in the mirror. Great. We're wearing uh, the appropriate headwear, and we yeah. have our surgical You can't have enough mirrors. Visible. Great. Oh. Oh, and there's a, there's a live um, trace of uh, the obs of this patient who is very stable, thankfully. Yes, that's a good sign. Even though we're it? missing an anaesthetist. <laughs> well, we better load that next then. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, what else do we have in this theatre? So I think one of the coolest features of this simulation is that there's a giant video projector, or at least a video screen here on, hanging. Uh, on the boom, and the image that's being generated is coming from the end of your laparoscopic instrument. Yeah, and Even here's the fruit pipe in the, the trachea, which, there we go. And if we try and get inside, would you believe this is where I've got a patient in theatre, or he's on his way to theatre, and he's got a little pen lid stuck in here. Disaster. It is a disaster. You don't happen to know him by any chance. He's a research officer who works at the University of Sydney. I hope that's not my Italian student. Uh, well, he said something about you know, his research officer, his supervisor being incredibly funny, so pro probably it's not yours. Well, you've got... <laughs> <laughs> if it is mine, you've got to save him. Someone's got to laugh at my jokes. <laughs> uh, so I reckon you can pro I can probably see your instruments in here. What do you think? Indeed, if I come in with my laparoscopic instrument, you'll see there's the end of my pincer. Oh, wow. And I can... And you reckon you can clip some slip, vessels slip. for me, perhaps? So this really shows off the tracking on this virtual reality system, that we can do precision work like this yeah, with virtual controllers. That's lovely. Do you reckon we can maybe even have a look around in the belly or... You know, one of the things about the virtual world I can already see is I can even go through the patient and 
It's not something that I could do in real life. So there's the bell using my virtual camera. Do you reckon might, maybe you could even wander in there with your head? Indeed, I think this is obviously... Give us a look. On a flat screen, we're all used to suffering a two-dimensional view of geometry like this, but in virtual reality, it can be 3D. Oh, wow. So for me, all of this stuff looks fully three-dimensional, and I get a much better understanding about the relationship between objects. That's, that's fantastic. So tell me a little bit more about... I mean, you've clearly been doing this for a while, for surgical simulation. What advantages do you see of this technology in surgery? Sure. Virtual reality has a lot of advantages as far as I can see. The, the main one for research is that we can fully control everything that happens within this volume of four by four metres. Mm. Uh, we can control all of the environmental objects and, and it, we, we can also fully control the sequence of events. So, for example, we can simulate emergencies that you wouldn't otherwise want to practice too often. Yeah. Uh, a second great advantage is cost. So we're using about $5,000 worth of equipment for this simulation. And obviously we could easily spend half a million dollars on a surgical simulator with real props and real tables and yeah, real instruments. True. Another great advantage is scalability. So the wonderful thing of this is if we invest effort to build one of these surgeries, we can then just email it or transfer it on a memory stick to a hundred other users or a thousand other users and mm -hmm. there's no scaling of cost. And what about, you know, um, remote training? That's what I think is really exciting. So the fact that we're standing here together in this vir virtual simulation is fairly arbitrary. We could easily be 8,000 miles apart and still be doing exactly what we're doing now. I'd be able to see you, you could see me. We could talk together over the internet, we could practice and collaborate together on a surgery, even though we're uh, in different countries. Yeah, and be together in the real world at the same time. In the virtual world, in the, real, in the same yeah, time. Yes, so it's powerful stuff, we think. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, that's very helpful. Now, I actually better get to work and get this patient to the theatre, so I'll catch you in a bit. Thanks, right, Hamish. Thanks very much. So my name's Jonathan Clark. I'm a head and neck reconstructive surgeon. You've already met Kai, who's our surgical innovation officer. We're going to show you today the workflow for reconstructing the jaw using the fibula, a leg bone, using virtual surgical planning. This lady had a cancer of her jaw, which was removed in China. And unfortunately, instead of replacing the bone, they've used a plate, which has now come through the skin of her chin. This is a pretty difficult situation to reconstruct. What we need to do is to start with is to see what the remaining bone looks like. Kai, can you simulate a model for me? Sure. In this case, I will use an open source software called 3D Slicer to construct a digital model for, um, from patient CT. Here you can see the 3D visualization of patient's skull and the patient's existing jaw. This looks pretty bad, Kai. The bone's all in the wrong position. It's all twisted. Would you be able to simulate what a normal jaw should look like? Sure. I have customized a healthy jaw for the patient, and now you can see I superimpose the virtual jaw over a patient's existing jaw. Okay, I can work with this. Would you be able to use your 3D printer to print that model out for me? Sure, I can export this file and transfer it to our 3D printer and get it ready for, to, for you. I'm on a little bit of a tight schedule here, Kai. How long is it actually going to take? It will take about two hours to get it ready in high resolution. Apart from this, I also 3D printed the patient's skull and the existing jaw for planning purpose. Okay. So this is the bone articulating with the skull here. Well, I think the next step is that we're going to need to bend a new plate that follows the exact contour of this model. I've just drawn on the model where I want the plate to go. And I'm going to send down a member of my team sure. to bend a new plate. I think they've done a pretty good job here. Yeah, it's looking great. Okay. Well, look, I'm going to need some guides during the surgery. And how are you going to make these guides actually fit the exact contour of her bone? Um, actually, it's very challenging, but I have a solution. I will use a new technology called um, surface model customization to make sure the cutting guide can match patient's jaw perfectly at the exact spot as we planned. So now you can see the cutting guide is being developed. 
and it will be 3D printed and be ready for the use. Look, I'm a little bit old-fashioned. I'm not sure this is going to work. I, I think we better test it first. Sure, definitely. Actually, you've done a pretty good job, Kai. Thank you. It fits the model precisely, and it actually fits right on a jawbone. Yeah, it's perfect. Like I said at the start, we're going to be using her fibula, which is a leg bone, to reconstruct her jaw. Now, look, I've just drawn on this bit of paper how I think we should cut that fibula bone so that it matches the contour. Can you develop some guides for me so that I can get this right? Sure. The drawing articulates the cutting angles and the measurement and the volume. So here you can see I use a software called 3D Studio Max to customize the cutting guide for this specific um, case. And here you can see I developed the holders to hold the fibula cutting guide in place during the operation. OK. So how are we going to fix it to the bone? Here you can see they are all drill holes, so they will be used to match the uh, guide to patient's fibula during the operation. Well, what, what about if I need to change the plan in the middle of the operation? Um, I have developed several options to adapt to the plan change, and all these cutting guides in variation will be printed and be ready for use. All right, and you're printing the guides out yeah, for me that's here? that's the printing process uh, from the top view, and I also um, this is the front view of the printing process. Okay. It's speed up 20 times faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take this into the operating room and see how it works. Yeah. So I've got the fibula bone here, and we've attached the guides with the screws, and I'm cutting the bone at the precise angle. And now we're just checking that the plate actually matches the guides. Yeah. I think that looks, yeah, not, not too bad. So the next step for us is to fit the fibula bone to her jaw using the plate that we contoured. Looking from the right, I'm pretty happy. Looking from the left, I think it matches yeah. the plan exactly. Yeah, it's looking good. Kai, I'm pretty pleased with this. This operation's taken eight hours and 12 minutes, but I think we've actually saved about four hours of operating time. Mm, that's a lot. And more importantly, <laughs> we've achieved an outcome that I just don't think that we could do using my expertise alone. So the next step for her is to uh, design some teeth. Yeah, I'm going to need your help with that too. Sure, no problem. Maybe not today. Okay. <laughs> Could you tell me a little bit more about what, do you, what you see the immediate benefits of this technology for you? Well, in a case like this, it, it's actually really difficult to get it right yep. without using virtual surgical planning. There's no reference points. I don't know where to put the bone, and I've got no way of working out how to place that bone in the right place. So if we don't get the bone right, I won't be able to put the teeth in the right position. And if we don't get the teeth right, she won't be able to chew, she won't be able to swallow, she won't be able to talk properly. You know, this is a really big issue. Yeah, so it's not just, you know, saving the operating time and the, you know, immediate benefit of that to the patient and the surgical team, but also the rehabilitation in the long term. And, and I imagine both of that also saves costs. So, well, firstly, how much does this cost? All right, well, look, not all hospitals have got someone as talented as Kai working with yeah, them. Yeah, that's true. And if we were to do it somewhere else, then these can be done with industry, and it costs about $10,000 wow. per case to use the virtual surgical planning. Wow, and so how much does it cost us now? Well, with Kai doing it, we're only using materials, plus, of course, Kai's valuable time and the materials cost a couple of hundred dollars. So it's a big, big wow. difference. So how much cost is that saving? Well, in an operation, it costs about $2,000 per hour to run an operating theatre. So if we're saving four, three hours, you know, there's $8,000 per case immediately. Not to mention salaries and not to mention that, you know, uh, what up here probably spends about 40 to 50 million per year just in theatre costs. Yeah. So if you scale that, that could be quite a significant saving to the health system. What about educational benefits? Yeah, well, something I didn't explain during the presentation is that when we do these operations, we do it on what's called ischemic time. And that means that we detach the bone from its blood supply. But that bone can only survive for about two, three hours without getting its blood supply back again using microvascular surgery. So it's always a challenge for me to teach my registrars and fellows how to do this in a limited time frame because we're pressured by that ischemic time. Yeah. But if we do this with virtual surgical planning, 
Well, they can take all the time they want to yeah. figure out how to cut the bone at the right angles, to bend that plate, which yeah. normally would have done in the operating theatre. So it really is quite a big advance for surgical training. And better training means better surgeon, meaning better care Definitely. at the end of the day. As you can see, health care is moving into an era of patient-specific solutions or customised health care. And what is really important is that these innovations are not only helping improve patients' lives, they're also helping decrease health dollars at the same time. As Professor Clark mentioned earlier, we are and we can um, increasingly implement these interventions at RPA at the present time. And I cannot underemphasize the importance of the support that we receive from the Sydney Local Health District, the Institute of Academic Surgery and Ghana Pass for nurturing this research because without that, it is not possible for us as surgeons to take our problems that we see in, a pa in our patient and put our creative and innovative juices to work and come up with what my patient Mark Prattley described as a purposeful innovation. However, even though this technology is around everywhere, most areas in New South Wales, most hospitals and health areas in New South Wales don't have access to this information. And for that, we need to disseminate this knowledge and we need a lot of teamwork. And I don't just mean the sort of teamwork that you've seen up today with surgeons and scientists working together collaboratively to come up with purposeful innovations. I mean everyone in health needs to engage with this and work as a team, including people in all different specialties, including educators, health administrators, policy makers, and especially the ministry. So I hope that this presentation has helped inspire some ideas that you can take back to translate some of this technology in your work. And we'd really love for you to come to our Snapchat sessions where we can give you a bit of hands-on demonstration of these technologies to try it out for yourself. Um, we will be present, uh, Kai will be presenting some of our research today and I'd really like you to, um, for, for all of the presenters to come on stage and um, really like you all to thank us for sharing, uh, for letting us share our research with you today.